Hello and welcome back to another video in the Introduction to Malware Analysis series. In this episode, we're going to look at an awesome utility called Procdot. As you're likely aware, SysInternal's Process Monitor, also known as Procmon, in combination with PCAP data, provides a treasure trove of information that is commonly used in behavioral malware analysis. The problem is, data from these sources is disparate and typically manual analysis is required to correlate process-related information from Procmon with a corresponding network-related activity derived from the packet captures. What if there was a utility that did that for us and presented the results in an interactive visual format? Well, that's where ProcDot comes into play. From the official website, which you're looking at now, ProcDot turns thousands of monitored activities into a big behavioral picture, which can be interactively explored making behavioral malware analysis efficient as it never was before. You can see some of the available features listed here, including, as mentioned earlier, the correlation of Procmon and PCAP data, visualization as an interactive graph, animation mode, smart following algorithms, detection and visualization of threat injection, and the list goes on and on. In the next section of the video, we're going to look at how to configure Procmon so that the data can be exported and then ingested by ProcDot. There are a few steps that need to be done prior to actually exporting that data so that ProcDot will understand how to read it. And then we'll show how to combine PCAP data using an example data set that I previously acquired. I think you'll be amazed by the results, so let's get started. Okay, here we are in our Windows 10 virtual machine. So let's go ahead and launch Process Monitor. Since this is the first time we're launching it in this VM, we'll need to accept the license agreement. So I'll click Agree here. And then each time we launch the software, we'll get the UAC prompt. So we'll say yes to that. And now let's go ahead and maximize this and resize some of the columns to make it a bit easier for us to read. And across the top, you'll notice the default set of columns, which of course we can customize. But as it is by default, we've got time of day, process name, PID, operation, path, result, and detail. Now I can make an entire video in and of itself about how to use Process Monitor, but that's really beyond the scope of what we're trying to accomplish here. That said, I will give you a brief tour if this is your first time seeing the software. Let's go up to the edit menu and choose auto scroll and we'll actually get a live representation of everything happening on the system. And you'll note that we see a lot of registry operations here. We see keys being opened and closed and registry values being queried. And we also see information related to threads and processes. We'll see information related to files, such as files being created, opened and closed. So just really a running total of just about everything happening on the system. And you can see in the bottom left that there are already hundreds of thousands of events being captured. And really, this machine isn't doing a whole lot. We just have Process Monitor running and not a whole lot else going on. So just a huge amount of data. Of course, we can go up to the Filter menu and then choose Filter. And we have a numerous amount of options on which we can filter. So we could go down to, for example, Process Name. And we could say Process Name is svchost.exe. We could add that and then click OK. And now we're only seeing data relating to svchost.exe. So it's really just that easy to filter on something. And of course, we could get very granular with those filters. Again, that's a little beyond the scope of what we're trying to accomplish here, but just know that there is quite a bit of information here. And online, there are plenty of resources you can find that will teach you how to use Process Monitor. Our mission, however, is to properly configure Process Monitor so that we can export CSV data so that it can be imported by ProcDot. The first thing we're going to need to do is go to the Filter menu and make sure that Enable Advanced Output is unchecked. And by default, it is indeed unchecked. In fact, if you check it, of course, you'll see the checkbox clearly displayed right here. So we'll go ahead and uncheck that, which is the default. But of course, if you've used Process Monitor for other things on the system, you may have enabled that at some point. So let's go ahead and make sure that's not enabled. And then next, we'll go over to the Options menu and we'll uncheck Show Resolved Network Addresses, which is checked by default. So let's click that. 
and then we'll go back and you can see that it is unchecked now. And then lastly, down to the actual select columns option under options. And under event details, we're going to want to make sure that the sequence number column is not checked, which it is not by default. But again, you may have changed this at some point if you've been using the tool. And then we are going to want to check the thread ID option under process management. So we'll check that. And that's pretty much it. Now we're ready. So assuming we have the data currently captured that we want to analyze with Procdot, we would simply go up to file, choose save. We of course can choose all events, the events displayed using the current filter that I have applied or just highlighted events. And then we're going to want to choose CSV for the output format. And you can see the path is the same path from which I launched the tool, which in this case is C colon backslash tools backslash sysinternals backslash log file dot CSV. So I would simply save this and we'll go ahead and overwrite the previous file that's there. And that's pretty much it. Now in the next and final section of the video, we're actually going to take some data that I've pre-cooked from another machine where I've got PCAP data and process monitor, Procmon data. And we'll take both of those data sets and import them into Procdot. And again, I think you'll be amazed by just how much detail we'll be able to see and by the fact that we can see it in a visual format, which is really, really cool. So let's go ahead and check that out next. Okay, let me first explain how I gathered the evidence that we're going to be looking at in this section of the video. I launched Process Monitor, or Procmon, using the configuration that we applied in the previous section, and I started a capture. I also launched Wireshark and started a capture at the same time. I then launched PowerShell.exe and issued a command to start a bits transfer, which is the background intelligent transfer service which, as the name implies, can be used to transfer data in the background from an HTTP, HTTPS, or even an SMB location. In this case, I grabbed the file from 13cubed.com for the purposes of generating some network activity so we'd have something to look at. And on the desktop, you'll actually see those two files. You see demo.csv from Process Monitor, or Procmon, and you see demo.pcap from Wireshark. So let's go ahead and launch Procdot. And once the program launches, we're actually going to need to go ahead and specify those two files. At the top, you'll see a monitoring log section and you see the first blank says Procmon. We'll click the ellipsis next to this and we will choose demo.csv for the top one. And then for Windup, we will choose demo.pcap. Now under render configuration, you'll notice a launcher blank. Let's go ahead and click the ellipsis next to it. And this will take just a moment to load, but what it's doing is it's finding the running processes and we can basically pick the process from which we want the graph to be generated or from which we want the graph to be focused. In this case, I'm actually going to choose powershell.exe from the list because I happen to know that's the process that will be most interesting for us. And here we will see that PID 5048 is PowerShell.exe. So let's go ahead and double click that. And then in the far right here, we'll click Refresh. And in just a few moments, the graph will finish rendering and we can take a look at the results. Okay, so quite a bit of data just for that very simple amount of demonstration that we did there. Now, first off, the blue is data from our PCAP, and you'll notice in the top left, we see only in PCAP, 13cubes.com. What happened there is that I intentionally issued a request for HTTP colon slash slash 13cube.com, knowing that it would redirect to HTTPS colon slash slash www.13cube.com, which actually ends up happening down here. So we'll see PowerShell.exe, PID5048 here, and we'll see numerous threads that are spawned by that process. Now, a lot of this is just normal PowerShell behavior, but if we start to look towards the bottom, we'll see some very interesting things. We'll actually see that what happens here is that because of the PowerShell commandlet that I issued, 
an SVC host.exe process was spawned, which is over here, PID1736, to facilitate that bits transfer request. In fact, if we right click on this and click details, you'll actually see on the command line that we've got the full path to SVC host.exe, we've got the dash K net SVCS flag, and then you'll see dash P dash S bits. So this is actually what's facilitating that bits transfer. And if we go back to this, we'll actually see the web traffic to 80 and then to 443 because of that redirect. We'll see that we're going to www.13cube.com along with the IP address to which that resolved. And we'll see the data transfer has occurred here. We'll also see a downloader log that has been written and we'll see that there's apparently been a file stored to appdata local temp named bit bit 1055.temp which was subsequently renamed to apg-win.zip which happens to be the name of the file that I downloaded in fact I could have renamed it and as I saved it but that's actually what's called hosted from 13cubed.com it's simply an older windows password generation utility so I downloaded that, and there you can see that because of the bits process, it was first downloaded as a temporary file and then renamed by bits to the target file name that I specified in the PowerShell commandlet. The other interesting thing that we see here is we even see file system forensic information. Here we see one of the two alternate data streams associated with the USN journal, which of course are the file system related artifacts that we would expect to see relating to file creation on the file system. So we can even get very granular and see that. Now we'll also see a conhost.exe process because anytime we use, of course, either Windows subsystem for Linux or cmd.exe or powershell.exe, conhost is the process that facilitates that console information. And we can even see additional registry keys being referenced here for various internet settings that were probably referenced upon execution of that web transfer that I issued with bits. So quite a bit of information here. And of course, I'm not going to go through all of this in any great detail. I just wanted to give you a general idea of what the graph would look like for even such a simple operation as downloading a single file from a website. So very, very cool stuff. But the other thing you can do is actually pretty cool too. In the bottom left, you'll see a film strip icon. And if we click that and then go over to the right side, you'll notice it defaults to 10 frames per second. We can actually go ahead and slow that down a little bit and just say, show me one frame every second and actually show me a replay graphically of what happened. So I'll go ahead and click the play button. And here you can actually see everything that happened in the order in which it happened. So you see the file creation, you see the, the threads being spawned from that 1892 PID. And let's just go ahead and let this play through for a moment so I can show you everything that happens here. And as you can see, we are now referencing registry keys. If you'll look at the timeline at the bottom as well, you'll notice the color coding matches what you see here. So it's just an amazing amount of information. And of course, we could speed this up to the default of 10 frames per second or some other custom value to make it easier. You can see, though, in a large capture from Procmon and from Wireshark, respectively, there would be just a massive amount of benefit in using something like this. We could actually take something that was unknown to us and actually figure out what a particular piece of malware was doing. If it was creating registry keys, reading registry keys, writing files to the file system, spawning other processes or threads from those processes, all of that stuff could be gleaned by simply looking at this visual representation of what was happening. So we'll go ahead and speed this up a bit so we can get to the very end here. And you can finally see the actual download taking place. And that's pretty much it. And by the way, in the actual very bottom here in this blink, you'll actually see some more detailed information. For example, process SVC host.exe PID 1736 sends TCP traffic to www.13cube.com, et cetera, et cetera. So very detailed information available there as well. 
And of course, at the menus at the top, we have various view options and configuration options. There's a lot more we can do here. For the purposes of this video, I simply wanted to introduce you to this tool. And even before that, just show you how to properly configure Process Monitor or ProcMon so that the data exported from there could be read and understood by ProcDot. So I hope this video has been very informative for you. And if there's interest, I'll actually create some additional videos showing some of the more advanced features of ProcDot. But for now, we've accomplished what I set out to do, which is just a basic introduction of how interesting and useful visual malware analysis can be with this awesome free utility. In fact, everything we've used here is a free tool from Wireshark to ProcMon to ProcDot itself. So just amazing amount of data can be gleaned from this kind of tool. So I hope this is useful and I hope you'll check it out and do let me know in the comments if you'd like to see additional videos on ProcDot or any others related to this particular topic. As always, please do like, subscribe and share and I will catch you in the next episode.